Welcome everyone to the Simons Institute uh, and to the boot camp on modern paradigms of generalization. Uh, my name is Sampath Kanan. I'm the associate director here at the Simons, uh, and I will see a lot of you if you're here for the program over the entire course of the semester. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Simons, uh, a brief word about it. Uh, founded in 2012 by a generous grant from the Simons Foundation, uh, the Simons Institute brings together you know, many groups of people for sustained collaborations um, on a particular topic over a semester, uh, generally in theoretical computer science. Although uh, we have been extending our limits of theoretical computer science to include interdisciplinary things that uh, theory can provide a useful perspective on. Uh, and so we've had programs, a lot of programs in quantum physics, quantum computation, uh, computational biology, uh, theoretical computer science, and the social sciences, things like that. Um, machine learning and uh, theory used to be really closely connected at the, at the origins of, of these fields uh, back in the 80s and before. Um, and we think that uh, it's profitable for both sides to be reconnected more strongly. And so the Simons has a sustained effort over the next few years in trying to have programs that connect theory and machine learning. So what can we say rigorously and with guarantees in the field of machine learning, in large language models, uh, things like that. Um, so we will, um, this is one of the first, but uh, we will have three or four programs in the next few years on these top, on this, uh, at this intersection. Uh, let me start by thanking the, the organizers of both the program and the boot camp, who happen to be identical in this case. Uh, chiefly, Mattis, who's been the main uh, person who's been communicating with us, but also uh, behind the scenes, I think, Poling, um, Andre, Daniel, Peter, who's our local spy on this uh, program, uh, and uh, Tony and Rich as well. Um, we look forward to a great program. And then let me give you a few ground rules. One important thing which you may be surprised to hear is that we do not allow any food or drink in the auditorium. <laughs> if you've brought food and drink by mistake, make this, uh, it's okay, but uh, don't do that again. Um, and um, we also ask that you leave the auditorium at the end of the day immediately and continue your discussions outside to allow the staff to close up and leave uh, not too late. So because the staff we're constantly monitoring on this workshop. So at 5 p.m. or whenever the program ends, um, please step outside and, and if you have to talk, keep talking back. Have a great program and let me hand off to Max. Uh, is the volume fine? It's not too loud? Feels a little loud. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming to the program and the boot camp and um, <clears throat> especially with the early morning and the uh, non-informative title. So uh, I'll just cut to the chase. The title is actually the uh, outline of what I'm going to tell you about. So I have uh, four goals today. The first one is I'm going to motivate the program. And I've actually ax asked them, even though it's an introduction to the program, to include this in the YouTube, in the YouTube video because it's sort of a call to arms to more than us. And one thing I'll include in that the concrete content there will be some open problems. And then um, it might have sounded a little bit too artistic, but I will mention something called the heliocentric model of Aristarchus. Uh, the heliocentric model, as uh, everybody knows, is about 2,300 years old. And um, if you trace the origin of science, you can also trace the origin of machine learning. And then I will have some uh, selfish content, which I will discuss a little bit about gradient descent. And I will talk about, interestingly, how there's a parallel between gradient descent and uh, actually the scientific method. And then I have some other stories. And you'll just have to wait to see what those are. So, oh, and I've instructed some subset of the audience to heckle. If you are, uh, have not been instructed and you'd like to heckle, that's also optimal. So yeah, so I'd like to uh, acknowledge a few people and point out some unusual things. It's on and off? OK. So uh, Sampav mentioned the organizers. And I'd also like to acknowledge the workshop chairs. So um, as, as everybody knows, the way these, these things work is the Simons program always have a set of workshops, which are pretty exciting. It's also exciting between the workshops. But just to uh, 
acknowledge all of the um, chairs, one of which has a visa problem, but still I will acknowledge all of them. So one is Samori. Hey, there's Samori. Um, Andre, we've already called out some third person. And then Fanny, of course, Fanny Yang has a visa problem, so she is not here, but hello over YouTube. And I'd just like to take a few comments about the Simons Institute, because many people are confused about the Simons Institute, especially when they hear about like the Flatiron Institute and other places. So a few um, comments. So Jim Simons, many of you know, passed away. And he took sort of a, uh, an invest, he's a mathematician, but he took sort of an investment fund approach to supporting the sciences. So all of the different Simons things are very different in style. The Flatiron Institute is different than the Simons Institute and, and things like that. And um, yeah, many, I have an anecdote for every person on, on this list. And if you uh, want to make a guess, uh, one of the people in this list is uh, photographed later in the, in the talk. So if you can guess which one appears in a photo in the talk. I will give you, uh, let's say, yeah, some amount of money. Let's say 20 bucks, if you can guess correctly who it is. The first person that tells me who. You know. OK, so feel free to email me if you have guess. OK, so yeah, getting to the actual content. So uh, generalization, making it as vague and uh, you know, not falsifiable as possible is just the ability of machine learning methods to perform well outside the data that they saw. And many of us are familiar with a variety of standard setups. I'm not claiming the one I'm writing here is the standard, but it is one of the ones a lot of us learn in our classes at the beginning. It's called the model of statistical learning theory. This one posits that the train and test data are drawn IID from the same underlying distribution. And just to compare some pros and cons, you know, it's always easy to beat up on you know, the old idea, but it had a lot of extremely valuable consequences, of course. One is there were a lot of intuitive concepts that were formalized via this model. One is, of course, the notion of capacity control, that if you have a large function class and you have a little limited amount of data, you're going to have problems. And this is very nicely formalized, even if you don't believe the assumptions. And also, many other methods were sort of verified by the, um, by, by the uh, a lot of methods were verified or derived via, via this concept. And I just want to say that no one ever believed this was a, a valid model. I mean, no, no one believed this. So it's, 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 there's no real point or there's no pride in, in beating up on the assumptions. So it was always just a nice way to verify things. So if you open most textbooks, they use spam as the justification of the model, which, of course, the first thing a spammer does is see what spam gets through and adjust their distribution, right? So it, it was always known that it's sort of an interesting simplification of what happens in reality. Um, I'll say that now it's sort of, I, I was maybe too aggressive. I said blatantly far-fetched. Uh, I'll just give three examples. Two kind of trivial ones are self-driving cars. You know, uh, you, your self-driving car is trained it's partially via some simulator and some real roads, and then you drive into the mountains and it blows up or something. Um, that's a distribution shift. Uh, generative models are an interesting one. People fairly explicitly feed text into their generative models, which are explicitly outside the training set. They're actually looking for interesting, funny corner cases in the prompts. And for LLMs, I'll list a few variety, uh, open problems. But uh, yeah, I'm just trying to <coughs> get through this setup pretty fast. Okay, any questions about this? I didn't offend anybody. OK, so just to highlight and highlight some of the differences between this standard model, uh, one of the standard models, and let's say an LLM, and maybe point out some explicit open problems. And just to give credit, one of these open problems was actually uh, provided to me by Peter Bartlett a few years back. So, you know, the basic perspective on an LLM is that it takes this input, just a bunch of unstructured text. That's one of the reasons why it's so successful. It has essentially infinite training data, all human knowledge. And the output is actually formally quite dif different. It actually outputs question-answer pairs, OK? And it, I think it's important to think about this as very different. If you speak to, for instance, I've spoken to people at Meta, and they've told me that it really does not give good question-answer pairs if you just do the unsupervised training. You really have to do one of these instruction tunings or something. OK, so there are two reasons this doesn't fit the statistical learning theory model. One is the distributions mismatch. So it's no longer a training and test or the same distribution. And the other one is just the task has a mismatch. Okay? And I'd just like to point out two very <laughs> wide open problems here. One is, why, why is this task useful for every subsequent problem? Why is it that for pretty much anything people come up with language, we can just do next token prediction, and it's so good for that problem? I mean, you, you can make your intuition. And if you're really confident in your intuition, then please provide me the theorem. 
Uh, the other one is uh, the difference between GPT and BERT. So GPT, just to be clear, does next token prediction, and BERT does this thing where it does uh, two forms, causal masking and then binary prediction on sentences. And it's very interesting. If you look at the BERT paper, it actually attacks the GPT model very explicitly. It uses the word harmful to refer to what GPT does. I mean, that's a quote. And so, but you know, you can make your intuition on why GPT, I've heard all sorts of words about GPT, why it's better, scaling laws. But for a theorem, I think it'd be very interesting to say formally why GPT is such a powerful model. Okay, so just two open problems. Uh, I actually won't revisit these two open problems, so. Oh, and I should say, you should always ask me for my sources. Sometimes I was uh, unacademically negligent. Uh, a lot of the sources for this slide and the next are just from the LAMA 3 paper. So for those of you who have not checked the LAMA papers, LAMA is open source. It's from, from Meta, Facebook, and um, they are quite thorough. So it's a good way to check best practices. You can also read their code. So, okay. For instance, I can tell you that Swiglu is used in modern machine learning because you can just read the code to Llama 3 and you can just see it right there. So, okay, so let's try to isolate a subproblem with an LM training, which is maybe closer to the statistical learning theory model. And so now I'm, I'm just looking at a subproblem, which is I take as input a bunch of unstructured text, and my goal is to do this mapping, which is context, a bunch of words or tokens as input, and then make produce a distribution over tokens. So this is really just the left-hand side is really just GPT. Okay, this is the GPT problem. And this still doesn't fit statistical learning theory. Now, this is a bit of a trick question in the sense that there are a bunch of X's you could have drawn on the right, but I'm just going to highlight one with distribution mismatch. And, uh, okay, so I think a lot of you are aware of this. This is open problem number three. So a lot of you, I think, are aware that for LM training, there's a significant difference in downstream performance based on how you balance your training data. Is everybody aware of this? Like if you crank up Wikipedia, you perform better later on non-Wikipedia tasks. Okay, is everybody <laughs> aware of this magic? And in Llama 3, they really doubled down on this one, the difference between Llama 3 and Llama 2 is exactly how they choose that mixture. Is anybody aware of what they did to produce the mixture? Pretty wild. You freeze the validation set and you optimize over the training set. So it's not, it's like explicit distribution mismatch. You're optimizing it away, okay? You freeze the validation set. And if you want the buzzwords in the paper, what it says is you freeze the validation set and you, you optimize over, over the training set balancing so that you maintain a scaling law, okay? So feel free to solve this open problem. Uh, the other one I'll mention, this is just a personal uh, a personal thing, because I, I like optimization. Um, of course, the data is um, highly non-ID, right? You, you take a document, you cut up into a bunch of prefixes, and you predict the next token. So <laughs> the two adjacent prefixes, they have significant distributional overlap, right? This is non-ID training. So if even in the convex case, we replace transformer with a linear predictor, we could not apply a standard SGD. But if you open your textbooks, you can find that there's a trivial way to make SGD work on Markov chains. The problem is the mixing time. So my claim is that if you plug in the mixing time for any one of these analyses, not only do you get a vacuous bound, qualitatively, not quantitatively, but um, actually I claim that the fact that it's not mixing is fundamental to how LMs work. So that's my fourth open problem, is even in simple cases produce a optimization analysis for this, which does not use mixing time and, and uses some different concept with a different final theorem. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about these four open problems I just dumped on you? Question? Yeah. I'm just confused about what your open Which one? I'm just confused about what your open the goal is. No, what the open dimension? What the open problem that you're referring to is? All four of these are significantly open. I don't know of anything in any math paper or book that can help scratch these. What kind of answer, I mean, there's, th I mean, there's lots of work on including theory and transfer from observing tests. And, I mean, is this like an open theoretical? Oh, do you mean question number, do you mean question number three? Yeah, a theoretical question. What is the theoretical question? For number three? For number three or number four? 
Okay, nobody understood any of my open problems. Okay, uh, so that's a good question. Yeah, what's the difference between open and open source? So I have, I, have a, I have a good joke here. The number of hands raised right now is the number of people that understood the four questions. So I don't even have to ask awkwardly to raise hands. Um, I, I mean, I think the problem with number four is for instance, like, it's like asking when does non-convex optimization work? It's like no. if something is mixed no. from a truck, then no. we'll it up, right? No, I really mean um, we can stick to the convex case. But what I mean is this, if you. No, no, I mean, like, Without mixing them, anything is without mixing them. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if you just sort of fit it in the in the negative, basically, anything that doesn't have. Yes. So let me give a version of number four, which is fairly crisp, and uh, I'm like being manipulative because it'll appeal to you. But for instance, in um, in Markov chains, there there are certain types of Markov chains. Like for instance, if you run a Markov chain on a mixture of Gaussians, where Within, if you're near one of the clusters, you're fast, but moving the transit time is exponentially slow between between the clusters. So one thing I think happens in these LLMs is this metastability phenomenon, where you actually stay within like local to a context, and then you have exponential transit times to to other regions of like the generation space. And so I would be interested in seeing a nice SGD analysis of this flavor for number four, where you could you know remove the transformer or make any assumptions you want to kind of simplify the model. And then, like any theorem of this of this type, I would be pretty happy about that. Yeah, I don't care. Math is cool. Do whatever you want. So I was actually asking, but I guess three. Yeah. So okay, I can come up with like fifty if you like. But um, one of them is that you know a lot of people like writing papers about scaling laws. So one of them is under what circumstances is it possible to optimize over a training set such that you get a scaling law. I think it's, it's <laughs> maybe like the, the higher level questions that like some kind of like question around how do you choose proportions for data mixes or something? Like if you have a couple of fixed data sets and the thing that you have control over is the well, relative proportions or something. Like how yeah, do there you are many deadlines coming up, so feel free to answer these however you like. And, uh, <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need to credit me, it's fine. But if you want money for the answer, then you, you know, might need to satisfy me. By the way, I believe what you were saying, but uh, I, even though everyone seems unsatisfied, I actually believe those questions serve their purpose. So. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so back to what I'm trying to do in this, or we're trying to do in this program. Uh, what I'm trying to do in this talk and what we're trying to do in this program is, um, so the goal of generalization is to analyze uh, why machine learning works beyond its training set. And sort of my opinion on what could happen in this program is to, of course, take old ideas and sort of figure out what the span of them is, figure out how to use creative ideas creatively use old ideas. For instance, a lot of people, and um, just to ping Nati, who's, who already asked, asked some questions, there are a lot of times people say that uniform convergence can't prove something. Do you just use uniform convergence as a tool within a proof? You can actually use uniform convergence to prove many things that don't seem to be uniform convergence concepts. So to extremely extend all the ideas and also then work in the orthogonal complement, kind of see where we need new ideas. And that's why, if you've been wondering why the boot camp looks like it has such a diversity of topics, it's because there are so many ways that we could we could proceed. And um, I'll just mention some of the topics here. There's a couple of us talking about classical stuff. There's a lot of stuff on distribution shift and robustness, um, some stuff on double, uh, double descent and interpolation related ideas, uh, distribution learning. And, um, and then we have a, a grab bag of, some, of some, some other topics. OK, so if you're wondering why there's such a diversity, it's basically because uh, there are many directions you could go, and it'd be nice to have as many uh, ideas shared as possible. OK, so we are almost done with section one. Uh, OK, so just to summarize this portion, kind of the main thing I said was that uh, statistical learning theory is this train and test. And it was a good idea, and it will continue to be a good idea. It has a lot of nice tools. It uh, verified a lot of intuitions, provided some methods. Um, it's OK that it's impractical. One point, thing to point out is that it ignores many beautiful phenomena that sort of things we're studying here. And then I also highlighted some open, uh, open problems in LLMs, interpret them as you will. And what I'll do next is this um, science portion where I was trying to understand sort of the assumptions for machine learning that came before statistical learning theory. So any questions so far? Um, I'll tell you one of the other stories uh, there's actually there's only one story. I just want to point 
something out. So that's the definition of gradient descent. And the loss there is the cross-entropy loss. Um, I would really like to know why, in terms of energy usage, 99.9% .9 of all machine learning uses only this loss. I wish I knew why that was true. So, I mean, people are literally talking about building nuclear reactors just to run this. It's not, I mean, it's, there's serious discussions about this, so if somebody could tell me why, that'd be pretty nice. But yeah, this is just other story part one. Okay, so I was uh, curious what came before statistical learning theory, and I ended up going uh, quite far back. So for anybody who's interested in historical aspects of machine learning and statistics, there's a professor at, I think it was University of Chicago, who has a number of interesting papers on this topic. Uh, he has one about maximum, he has a book and two papers that are notable I'll mention today. One is about maximum likelihood. Uh, if, you, if you read what the, what the quote says, he says that um, you know, even before people could formalize it, it's just sort of a natural idea of hundreds and gatherers. It sort of makes sense that you go where you expect things to happen. And I liked that he didn't specify humans in his abstract. I showed uh, ants falling pheromone trails, which also uh, uses the principle of maximum likelihood. Um, and I, when I was digging through the literature for this, and let's say the origin of least squares and stuff like this, I kept finding one problem coming back over and over again, which was the study of orbits. So a lot of machine learning and a lot of statistics and a lot of science was actually based on the study of orbits, which, uh, just a personal comment, it's quite nice because it's just people staring at the sky and either making stories to themselves about deities and things or, um, you know, thinking about why it's true and what's actually going on up there. So I find this quite amazing that people just looked up and then figured all this stuff out. So I'll tell you about four anecdotes and then I'll try to extrapolate from them some concepts about the scientific method and how it relates to statistics. So the first one is Cauchy is typically credited with gradient descent. In terms of references, it seems he's first. Um, Gauss is, it seems the record is fairly clear at this point that Gauss is not the first to have come up with least squares. Um, but I will mention his book, which is about 400 pages of orbit calculations using least squares. Uh, then there's Kepler and elliptical orbits, and then uh, one of the titles, which is this guy Aristarchus from, from Greece. So I'll, I'll tell you these four anecdotes. So I won't say much about gradient descent. I'll just say why Cauchy did it. So two comments here. So the definition of gradient descent I gave before is this one you're all familiar with, or how you write the PyTorch code, or whatever you like. Um, but then another very nice way, sort of the mirror descent flavor of writing gradient descent, is just this trade-off between an approximation of the energy you're minimizing and some distance criterion. So fairly explicitly from the definition, gradient descent is not, it, gradient descent's job was never to minimize an objective. Its job was always to trade off and balance a norm and an objective. I'm just highlighting that. Gradient sense job was never to minimize a function. It was always to trade off between these two. Okay. Um, I did try to look at Cauchy's paper, and I didn't see him explicitly highlight this trade off. But just to point out, Cauchy had a, an equation in six variables that he wanted to find a, a local minimum for, and he really didn't feel like grinding it, so he came up with gradient descent, and he ran a couple iterations by hand. There's a nice paper by Claude Lemarchal. If you're familiar with the name, he's a convex analyst. He has a, a nice paper where he includes footnotes that are the ex original French. Okay, that's anecdote number one. Anecdote number two is studying noisy data to make astronomical estimates. So on the left, by the way, is uh, Tycho de Brahe's um, observations of the angle to Mars. Now, I don't know about all of you, but if I look at the left, I don't think elliptical orbit, okay? I don't know if anyone here can just look at that and guess elliptical orbit. <laughs> if you can, uh, you know, so pretty good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so, so he, and look at the, how many years he did this, right? And this is pretty serious dedication. Um, and I, I should say that for some of these slides, I'm using uh, material from this talk by Terence Tao called The Cosmic Distance Ladder. I would just say that if you're not familiar with this talk, I highly recommend checking it out if you're on, uh, just for posterity, people are watching this on YouTube, 
pause this video, <laughs> watch that one. So, um, yeah, so Gauss, so uh, there's a paper I mentioned at the bottom by uh, the, the same historian who uh, tries to determine if Gauss actually had least squares in 1790s as he claimed. Um, but this is from Gauss's 1809 book. And obviously, if you look at the data on the left, it's very noisy. And that's actually very interesting because, so what are you doing when you're, when you're a scientist? You make, you make predictions, you make models, and then you want a systematic way in order to rule out whether the model is correct or not. Okay, so I'll, I'll call this the y given x problem. So you make a model of, of y given x, and you just try to be able to formally say whether it's close or not. Okay, and Gauss was faced with a ton of orbital calculations, and he really wanted to know if his estimates based on noisy data were accurate. So he, um, so he came up with least squares, and had all sorts of ways to estimate the error for it. I should say there's another reference I found interesting when I was, uh, when I was prepping this. There's a paper by Kolmogorov where he analyzes like a bunch of terms and assumptions in. Uh, so I'll, maybe I'll put that here as well. If you want to look up Kolmogorov, you can. There's a Kolmogorov paper on, on the title as Gauss and least squares. I forget the rest of it. Okay. That's the second anecdote I wanted to share. Now the third one I found pretty remarkable. So as I mentioned, this data was taken over the span of almost 20 years by Tycho de Brahe, maybe it looks like basically 20. And um, this is the information that was used by Kepler to determine that there are elliptical orbits. And what I find amazing is that many aspects of the next two anecdotes reminded me of what happens in those LM open problems I said. So LM open problem three was this one about the data proportions, how you re rebalance data proportions and include extra data. If you want to solve a problem that has nothing to do with Wikipedia, you throw in Wikipedia data. Or not even something about factual, you still throw in Wikipedia data or analytic data or symbolic data or something like that. So in order to, <laughs> in order to determine the, orbital, the orbits of Mars, Kepler included a bunch of other information. He just pumped information into the calculations he was doing. You know, and for me, this sounds like the same distribution shift that I was talking about before, where you want to make some comment about Mars, and you throw in stuff about all the planets and all, all sorts of different things. So um, yeah, that was, that was how he did this. And another aspect which is interesting is it's also time series data. And he, he brute forced getting rid of the time series data, which is that Mars returns the same, its orbital length it was 687 days. And so he just samples this every 687 days, which also means that, you know, Tio de Brahe really needed to accumulate lots of data for this to be viable. Okay. Um, and now for the last anecdote, which is uh, one of the ones I slipped into the title. So, uh, Aristarchus of Greece, he made a lot of these old celestial calculations, things like distances to celestial bodies. And he was the original one to come up with a heliocentric uh, concept of, of, the, um, of the solar system. And I just drew this picture like this because his, uh, his original intuition on why this is the case is because it makes no sense for something much larger to be orbiting, orbiting around something much smaller. Uh, and I should say that even though it's always credited to Copernicus, the, or it's frequently in popular literature credited to Copernicus, the heliocentric model, if you control F on Copernicus's document, you find Aristarchus cited explicitly. So it was known. Um, and I should also say that the usual reason that it was claimed that the Greeks rejected the heliocentric model was a philosophical or a religious one, but actually there's a data there's a data accuracy and an, and an out of distribution story behind it. So what people were frustrated by, or they used to, to attack the model, was they claimed that the model made certain incorrect predictions for out of distribution data. So the claim was that if you look at the stars as the Earth's orbit is at different, at opposite points, so you look at, if you assume that we're orbiting around the sun and you look at, you look at the two opposite points and then you check the location of the stars, the claim was that they haven't moved. So we can't be in a heliocentric setup. So everybody follow what I'm saying? So 
so Aristarchus made up a model for the orbits of the planets, and then they used out of distribution data, the stars, to argue that his hypothesis was incorrect. And the reason that they couldn't measure, they, they couldn't verify with parallax, it's called parallax, you can do this on the opposite sides. The reason they couldn't verify that the stars were moving was because they didn't, they didn't have good enough telescopes. Their data was too messy. So it's an added distribution story and a messy data story and that took uh, you know, 2,100 years to resolve. Uh, that is, yeah, th thanks, Misha. That is an exceptionally perceptive point. In fact, what they said back then was that it can't be the case that they didn't move or th within the tolerance of the, because the stars cannot possibly be so far away. So the estimates implied for the distance of the stars they claimed was just, they couldn't fathom such, such distances. Yeah, good, you're 100% you're correct. I didn't make that up, by the way, that is the answer. <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of the anecdotes. Now I'll try to extrapolate. Does anybody have any questions or comments on, on uh, these four anecdotes before I move on? Yeah, go on. So uh, when you're talking about that open problem three, when you're asking that why validation data being different from the training data might help, it's almost uh, like trying to ask when I'm trying to learn the task itself, the algorithm itself, I'm trying to not be specific to the data that I have. Yeah. So, like, it's basically the difference between classical, uh, like, models training on the given data uh, and trying to learn a particular function. In, instead of that, the task now is to uh, learn uh, to be able to get in a data set and get out of a function. Yeah. So, uh, could that be the formalism or uh, okay, I realize people are frustrated because I was vague and uh, people are not enjoying that I was intentionally vague. Um, there, are many, there are many setups you could follow for this. Uh, one, um, yeah, one is the version you said. Let me phrase it in another way, which is like a, a DRO version. So, because John Ducci is going to talk about, wait, did I, maybe can you say your version again? My version is, uh, my goal is to learn, given a particular data set, uh, like, uh, my data set could change, okay? My goal is, given any data set, I can find out, like, the pattern that I have. Mm -hmm. It's not specific to the data that I have. It's not like I'm, I have a given data and a feature regression function to that data. Yes, that is, that is, um, that is a version of it. Uh, I'll, I'll also say that, that there are, related questions that are in the literature. For instance, because they're taking a supremum over the reweightings, you could view it as a distributionally robust optimization task. But the interesting thing is that it's focusing on doing well on the specific target, which is, which is what you're uh, mentioning. So yeah, I'm not familiar with the version of this formal formalism in the literature. Does anyone else want to ask about uh, <laughs> the open problems? I mean, I'm ahead of schedule, so it's <laughs> Can you go back to that calcium gradient descent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's up? I just wanted to look at the, the gradient descent formulation one more time. Yeah, I believe I did not. For those of you that are wondering, you make them equivalent by differentiating the second and setting it to zero. And I wrote it in this way with, you know, some of the terms are extraneous, right? When you differentiate with respect to W, you don't, I didn't need to write that. I wrote it to sort of capture what Koshi was actually doing. So I'm a little confused about the connection. I mean, this is the way we can think of gradient descent in general, right? You can always think about it forming a quadratic and minimizing it. Um, so in that sense, like it's always connected to regularization if the regularization is the quadratic. Yeah. But somehow you're saying for Cauchy, this was more tied to the application? Yeah, so I was hoping that in Cauchy's I could find, well, he didn't write the second version, he wrote the first. And I was hoping I could find 
a statement about staying close because he did he did discuss local the case the issue of local optima, but he didn't say anything about which local optima it selects like the close by ones. So, yeah, it's just maybe I was uh, I guess part of what's bothering you is I was overemphasizing an obvious fact, which is is trading off the two. Um, yeah, some agreement with you. Yeah, Peter. Since we've got some time, uh, yeah. I'm curious in, in the set of anecdotes that you told us, in, especially in relation to the program, was it intentional that you didn't mention Newton, who came up with a beautiful theory for the elliptical orbits? Uh, well, yeah, why did I not mention that? Um, I mean, I should have, yes, okay, good point. <laughs> yeah, I was just motivated by, um, yeah, okay, I should have included that. <coughs> Good omission. Good omission to point out. So, um, I want to push back a bit. Several things you said are don't fit with statistical learning theory okay. or not. Learning Excellent. Theory. And um, maybe especially since you put me down in the classic column there, I don't know what that. Is. Oh, excellent. Okay, good. Um, I mean, I think we have to be uh, careful there because I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but it doesn't fit with statistical learning theory. Okay. It maybe doesn't fit with, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, this basic supervised learning model where you're learning from uh, IID data from the same source distribution you're predicting to or predictor. But as you mentioned at the beginning, that's just like the a simple case to yeah. start with. It doesn't capture everything. And there has been work on many of these things. So in particular, uh, um, when you talked about uh, using this uh, task of next uh, next token prediction, mm -hmm. and um, the idea of using auxiliary, that is not what you care about. The idea of using auxiliary tasks to, in order to, uh, you know, have some task that you're interested in, like question answering, okay. and then you invent all kinds of auxiliary tasks, yeah. and you transfer for them in the, in the multitask setup is uh, well established, you know, for over 20 years uh, with both theoretical and, uh, and empirical work. That's true. So I think it's important here t to maybe zoom in on exactly what is it that's um, distinct now. That, yeah. That, that, you know what we do understand and what we don't. Um, and yeah, that's fair. And, um, and so in particular, I think being a bit more specific there, I think this idea of uh, of transfer from auxiliary tasks is definitely. I think if you want one specific reference, probably <coughs> and Jang. Uh, uh, and Jang would probably. The first to really put it on the table on the table. I'm actually not aware of that reference. What what are the two what are the um, Tong Zhang and Oh Tong Zhang, sorry. Okay. Uh, do you know the first name? Okay. Um, it's like two thousand and five ish, I don't know. Um, and I think that what what is new here maybe is that in um, and then that's just one maybe uh, one reference, but in, in this work in the using auxiliary tasks, there were different predictors for each, there's a different predictor for each task. So the, the, you're um, using transfer between tasks, but you're not actually using learning the same predictor for each task. You're just tying them together in some way. And Andrew and Zhang's work is through some low rank uh, uh, structure, which really you can think of it as learning a, a, a two layer network. Yeah. Um, and I think what, what's maybe different in, in, in maybe less explored, if you do want like an open problem yeah. here, is that um, your, uh, what you're doing now is using transfer uh, from uh, auxiliary tasks, but we're training the same probabilistic model. So rather than training a different predictor for each task, we're training a single uh, a probabilistic generative model okay. uh, for multiple different uh, sources. So I have you know, one source I care about, and I'm using like a different source and fitting, you know, training for like the mixture of these two sources uh, in uh, the, the same probabilistic model. And that maybe is a bit, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to find an edge here to, to like yeah, find like, what is exactly near, but maybe the main message is we have to be a bit careful from these things like yeah. statements. If it doesn't fit, it's completely different. Like oh, OK, sure, that's fair. Um, okay. In some sense, this is even older, right? D domain generalization is basically that. Like, you get to see a whole bunch of environments, and then yeah. you don't get to change your predictor. You get to be, like, you know, evaluated in a new environment. But, but right, but in domain, but this is in uh, domain generalization, I mean, this is, this is or is a problem. It's not that you're, you, I mean, if you actually had data from the, uh, from the environment you care about, you just would train in depth. 
Right, that, that would be domain adaptation, right? Like if you do get to see some amount of data, then you get to right, right, right. Like the but, setting but, itself. But, like but, but here's a bit different because it's not that I, you know, I do have data from the domain I care about, but I still also get, you know, use data from other domains in order to help me on that domain, not just to generalize to different domains. But yeah, but you're, you're right. I mean, that's also, uh, this, and that's, again, it's worked in the early 2000s, domain adaptation. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll concede that point. I made a mistake of uh, maybe being a little too provocative and definitely not referencing a lot of important work. So yeah, those are two mistakes. But maybe if I can say something in defense. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of me? Wait. Oh, I don't need to be defended. I think you have to look at every individual problem. It's never going to be new because there is so much work on like every yeah, single task. And yet there is obviously something very new there, right? Yeah, yeah but, you know. But I wasn't crisp enough defining it, so I, uh, I take yeah, the criticism. It's fine. Okay, good. We have a semester to do it. So, <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, based on those anecdotes, I uh, just tried to extrapolate a little bit about the scientific method, essentially. So in all of those examples I gave, there was sort of this feedback of acquiring, uh, I was saying, carefully balanced, high quality data mixtures. I made it sound a little bit like that LLM setup. And then finding a succinct, I called it succinct interpretable models. I mean, I found it pretty interesting that people went straight from uh, circular orbits to elliptical orbits. I mean, they, they didn't have to, uh, you know, they could have picked more complicated curves, but they didn't. So. I guess everyone takes this as a given, they jumped that, but yeah, I found, found that quite interesting. Um, and yeah, so a couple uh, conclusions that I had from this was, one, in all of this, it's always about modeling P of Y given X, but the modeling of P of X, which we need for these statistical learning setups is not, um, it's just not present. Uh, and then another thing I highlight was, I felt that a lot of these open problems or the aspects of the setting that are different from statistical learning are similar to those LM setups I mentioned. And uh, lately was the, lastly was this uh, issue of balancing the model fit with the, um, with the size of the model or the succinctness. Uh, so then I come back to what I was calling the other stories and what you'll see at this point is the pattern is I'm always pointing out the, the log sum exp and all of these. So just to give a little bit of detail, I think most of you are familiar, but those of you that are not familiar, uh, one of the sort of workhorses in statistical learning theory is what's called a uniform convergence result. You look at the difference between the training error and the test error, and you take the, the ga this gap over some large class of functions. I guess I should have written uh, yeah, some large class of functions. And if you just stare at this, you could, and you know some statistics, you could guess, maybe using the moments or something to control the right-hand side. And of course you can do that. You can use moments of different types. And um, if you have all the moments bounded, you can get a good bound that way too. But what's interesting to me is that the standard way people control this is by once again invoking a log sum exp. So what I wrote here is the definite, for those of you who are familiar, the definition of subgaussian. I've just sort of uh, rearranged the two sides. I took a log of both sides and divided by the parameter of the definition. So, yeah. <laughs> this is yet another place log sum x shows up fundamentally in the literature. Okay, so now for the last part, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, gradient descent. As I mentioned, this is the a uh, biased part of the talk because this is about things I work on and things I like personally. Um, so here's the definition from before. I'm again being a little bit artistic and not uh, just calling the norm constraint a, a succinctness constraint. And so my first question is, can we formalize this trade-off or make it more crisp in a theorem? And the answer is yes. I will tell you about maybe so just personal bias is maybe my favorite property of gradient descent or gradient flow. So here I'm using sort of infinitesimal gradient descent where you've defined it via an ODE. 
And I've left off the assumptions under which the OD has sol a unique solution, but let's just take that as a given. So instead of gradient descent, this is gradient flow, infinitesimal step size, you just flow in the negative gradient direction of your objective F. And I should have said that F is convex here. Sorry for that. Okay, so here's the theorem. And again, this theorem is meant to capture the fact that, oh, missing a term. This theorem is meant to capture the fact that gradient descent trades off between norm and, and loss. So it's saying for all reference points W bar and for all time, I have the distance traveled and the objective at time t is less than that same quantity. Oh, this should be wt, w bar. Same quantity, but for this reference point, okay? So now many of you have probably seen this where what happens is people say this term is non-negative and so that you just drop it and you only look at the right-hand side and it's telling you that you're going down at a rate of one over t but I'm highlighting the fact that the left-hand side term that is often dropped is very fundamental to how machine learning works. It says that you can never have the property that you move too far from a good reference solution. So with a little bit of algebra, and just to be clear, this is still part of the theorem, you can derive the following statement. Either you've passed below the reference point in terms of objective value, or you're at most twice it in terms of norm. Again, the difference between what you might have seen in a convex optimization textbook is that I have selected not to drop this term. Okay, and because uh, this is my favorite thing ever, I want to show you how easy it is. So the way a lot of these proofs work is they start with this potential function. You look at the norm squared between the iterate at the final time and at the initial time. And I have to say that when I was learning this literature, I always found it interesting that this was a potential function because I was taught that gradient descent minimizes an objective, but then the potential function did not have the objective. <laughs> so, okay. And the next, and the other nice thing about this proof is I essentially only have, it's like a, set of forcing moves in a, in a chess game. I only have one possible step. I can do it every, I can do every time. So the first one is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let me clean up my handwriting a little bit. So the first one is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. And then we just differentiate. So I have that time derivative. And this, okay. Now I use the definition, or sorry, not the definition. I use the fact that W dot S is a solution to the ODE. So I get the objective. So there's a minus sign, that's why I flipped this. And I use convexity. So at every step, I only have one thing I can possibly do. Then I use convexity. And then, just because this proof is so clean that I would like to include every single detail, I don't want to sweep anything, I don't want to hide anything in this proof. Uh, so I can lower bound this iterate at time s by the iterate at time t. This is, and this now is, so now we're done. So now we, re we can rebalance the size and get the first statement. I just be clear, I will explain uh, this missing step for you, but um, we've, we've established this after you just divide. So just to be clear, the, re the reason why that is doing descent does not even rely on uh, convexity. If I look at DDS of F of WS by chain rule, I get this, which is this. It says that we're um, this is strictly doing descent. Okay, so this is not really much going on here, but it gives a powerful result. And I did not yet give this factor two part the fact that you never go two times away. There are many ways to s to check that step. I'll just do it. Uh, one of the ways. So 
So if I look at uh, this quantity, and I add and subtract, Sorry, I did not need that. Yeah, I look at this, I add and subtract, or sorry, yeah, you add and subtract from the inside. You get this, then you apply what we just did. And you get about the one half. So now if I just look at this expression, this final exp if I just look at the left and the right hand side, if it's the case that, that um, we are above an objective value, then it must be the case that uh, this one is less than two times this one. There's no other way to satisfy the inequality. Okay. So this, this claim says, okay, so that's, that's the end of the proof. And so we've both given this sort of uh, self-regularizing inequality, and we've given the consequence that unless we fall below an objective value, we can't be more than twice in terms of norm. Okay. Any questions about this? Can you generalize this to uh, other challenges? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah, so actually this is, the, there are many reasons why um, yeah, there are many reasons why I like this proof a lot. So Nati was just asking if I can generalize it to other geometries, and sort of the, uh, the, the most uh, trivial one, of course, is to look at, is to look at mirror descent. Uh, it's not as clean interpretable in the sense that it, uh, here we used, here in order to get the factor two inequality, I had to use this expanding the square on the squared norm, and so the th I'm going to write out the proof. I'm, I'm not going to get the same statement that says that we're like twice in terms of the Bregman divergence. I actually don't know how to prove such a statement. But um, just, to, just to be clear how clean the proof is, it, go it basically is exactly the same sequence of steps with no, added, with no added inequalities. So you still just differentiate the Bregman divergence and use the definition of the mirror flow and the steps go through, use Fenchel Young and, hmm? Yeah, you write out the definition. And then you just push it through and use the fact that the mirror flow now, the mirror map appears in the definition of the flow. So in the place where we just used the ODE definition, we still use an ODE definition. It's exactly the same proof. Yeah. Yes, this works in other geometries. Uh, yeah. So we do twice the sum with minus one to the first one. That's correct, yeah. Um, is it, am I correct that you said that the factor is like four or something? Or does that spin off into the first one? Uh, I think, so, some, f I, I, I always get in these struggles with myself which way I like to write this theorem. I think it was, I'm, Unless I made a error, like an algebraic error when you when you saw me do it, it, it should have been this four. The just for everybody that's that's listening in, the difference is that when I wrote this statement, it was not the squared norm; it was the norm itself. So if f w t is l greater than um, f w bar, then I get the inequality less than w zero minus w bar quantity squared and you square root both sides and move the two to the right hand side and then you get the factor two. So I believe it was this one with the four, um, but I actually remember that when we were at the board and Siv was there and I remember I got flustered at one point. So I think I, think I might've accidentally messed something up and put in like an eight or something, <laughs> but yeah. So I, I also just want to check that the only place you use convexity is in the first order equation. Yes, in fact. Um, you do have two inequalities. The last line is actually an inequality even though you wrote an equality. Yeah, so, so this, this inequality where introduce the factor of two by expanding the square, and just for everybody that isn't um, as comfortable with this, uh, because this proof is so clean and so basic, I really don't want anyone to feel like there's some like disgusting set of steps that I've, I've, um, I've skipped. But you know, one way, for instance, to do that is triangle inequality 
and, and then ex uh, and, and then extend the injury. So yes, so th this step is actually horrifically loose. This this is a, this step is a nightmare. All the other steps can be can be tight. Um, in terms of the use of convexity, the only place it was used was here. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is you can still choose not to apply convexity and have the same statement. So, uh, not, sorry, not the same statement. You can't do collapse the last steps, but you still get a theorem in terms of this inequality with, with just the gradient in there. So, uh, for instance, I've used this to analyze this TD, TD method, temporal difference method, and you actually, even though it's not a convex setting, you can still use, you can still use this. Any other questions about this? Oh, sorry. Do you mind repeating the like upshot, like the either or statement, the consequence again? It's yeah. Um, so th the one way to actually look at it is ac is just to ignore the the first case. So run gradient flow. So you have some reference point. Somebody handed you a solution. Maybe they say it's the optimum or something, and then you run your gradient flow until you match it in terms of objective value. Another way to think about it is that. Oh, I guess it's going to switch the. So I'll just I'll I'll draw over here. Let me, uh, let me add myself a page. Another way to look at it is gradient descent starts here, okay? And somebody hands you the W bar. And they, they just hand you this. They say it's pretty good. You don't know how good it is. They don't know if it's optimal. And let's say you look at the level sets of the function. You look at the level set rooted at W bar. What this is telling you is that if you run gradient flow from here, the point where you hit that level set, the set of points such that the objective function is equal, this point, the norm from W0 is at most two times W bar. Yeah. I should also, uh, Nati was on my case earlier about references, I should say that this factor of two, I can't tell if it's optimal in the setting. Also, it's very difficult to prove any improvements to it. So one of the only ones I'm familiar with is, uh, is Ryan has a result for least squares specifically, where he's able to bring that factor of two down um, in a very general setup. and. Um, yeah, with a f with a clean proof, but um, yeah, this this one is you, you have to break fairly general. Ryan, is your paper flow or is it descent? It's both or. Did, did I answer your, your question? I think the easiest way is not actually treat as an either or. You just pick the time such that you hit the point. There, there are many ways to rewrite the inequality to get a different uh, intuition from there. And yeah, I didn't um, finish the steps for Nati's question, but if you appropriately redefine the ODE for mirror flow, then it lets you just push through these steps. And but it's not you wouldn't get a factor. Of, I mean, you wouldn't get the same. Um, yeah, you get you get something kind of, to be honest, kind of uninterpretable. Or I've used it, but it's fairly clunky. So for KL divergence, I have like a statement. I get like a factor eight or something, but. Say in general that you your divergence to uh, oh I see well yeah I yes I believe I understand Nati's Nati's comment yeah so if I whatever it's like oh what would I are we arguing about what is what is the question what's the comment <laughs> but um, yeah so the the question is if we change the geometry and um, yeah, and just to be clear, for mirror flow, the it, it looks something like, I don't think I'm messing this up, it, the theorem looks like this. So you're saying that in this modified geometry where we put the gradient of the mirror map inside of there. So this is how you define it, and if you use this definition for the flow, then you can still push through the proof. However, you will not get a statement this clean where this right here is, um, this is, for the Euclidean geometry, this is two times, this is the square root of two times the the divergence. So you will not get this this statement with with a general divergence. You'll get some you'll get some weird uninterpretable thing, which is like for the kale with a lot of work I could get. But it's a good question. Yeah. So open problem. I get other geometries <laughs> with factor two. Okay. Um, good. Oh, so some. Oh, any other questions about this? This is my favorite thing ever. So. Many people here have seen me do versions of this. So. so it's just some remarks about it. So one is that in order to get an effective theorem from here, uh, 
in my experience, does require a lot of sensitivity, both the norm and the sublevel set, because if you just think about it, factor two doesn't actually say that much. And just to proof remark, the proof really is identical to the gradient descent proof. So in particular, for the gradient descent proof, you look at the difference of the potential still, and then you don't use the fundamental theory of calculus, you use a telescoping sum. It's the same proof if you expand the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus for Riemann sums boils down to a bunch of telescoping sums. It's the same proof for gradient flow and gradient descent. The difference is that the regularity conditions for the gradient flow can, can be relaxed. So that's, yeah, that's why there's, there's some difference. But this proof goes through for lots of settings. I didn't mention mirror descent, like not to mention, but it, it goes through for cascading gradient descent. Um, I will, I think, skip this just so I finish on time, and I think people are maybe tired of me talking about it so much. Um, I'll just say that to get an effective theorem for linearly separable settings, there is kind of a natural choice you can make for this reference point, and kind of uh, you get a very strong statement in the sense that you plug in the structure of the loss function and this particular choice of the objective, or the particular choice of the reference point, and you actually get a statement not that you're factor of two, but you're very close to, you kind of can shrink, can shrink that, that distance. Um, just to give some references, since some of the people are here, or almost everybody's here. <laughs> so this, the first time this for linear prediction appeared was um, 2018, but also Jingfeng Wu, who's right there. Hey, what's up? Uh, and then this is, this B is uh, Peter. So uh, I, won't, I won't belabor this. Uh, actually, <laughs> so I want to I want to share this photo. So uh, I'm not trying to imply that most of the speakers were working on their slides at like middle of the night last night upstairs one floor. I'd also like to point out that for people that were trying to identify the staff member who was in the second slide and is in a photograph, this is Gary, the um, cleaning staff who uh, remembered me from my last visit and asked me how I'm doing and where I'm. He remembered where I was like living and all these things, so it was pretty cool. Um, but yes, we were not working on our slides in the middle of the night last night. So uh, I just wanted to mention some, if you find this type of material interesting, I wanted to mention some other results. The literature usually uses the term implicit bias. Actually, this term has been forgotten. Last time I saw implicit bias, it was actually about like uh, social biases. Last time I saw implicit bias in a paper title. Um, and also, for those of you that know the history of the Laura papers, the Laura papers cite essentially a bunch of empirical implicit bias papers, but they didn't know about the implicit bias literature, maybe because of the name clash. So um, yeah, this idea comes back a bunch of times, but just to mention some results by people in the room, or almost all of them are in the room. So uh, Nati was the first to do the gradient descent uh, version of this for uh, linear prediction. Um, Kai Fung, who's, hey, what's up? Yeah, Kai Fung is here. Yes, I'm dropping co-authors. Actually, I don't even know the full set of your co-authors since you added some like with the journal version. So, so. Was, was he on this one too? Okay. Let's see, now I have to add myself to the slide and I don't want to do that, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, Kai Fung made a generalization where for multilayer ReLU, and that's just what I wrote to be interpretable, um, but basically for multilayer ReLU, I say infinitely often you go to local, local, um, locally optimal solutions. I say infinitely often because what he proved was that the cluster points are uh, local, local maxes with an interesting proof technique. Actually, this paper by Kai Fung, he rediscovered like a lot of the technology from the previous decades without having ever seen it. It was pretty amazing. Um, then this. The only dip, so this was, I'll give the credit here to Zhu Ag because uh, he did the, all the hard parts. Um, the difference between these two lines is that the infinitely often is removed. So one is about cluster points and the other is about limit points. And if you think this distinction is trivial, uh, you can talk to Kai Fung about it. So. <laughs> um, and then I also want to highlight Margulit's result. Where's Margulit? Hey, how's it going? So um, yeah, and all of, all of these people are here all, all semester. So um, you'll notice the last two, they had a local max margin. And I should say that this is not how Margulit phrased her theorem, but I'll, I'll put it in context. So she studied 
two layer ReLU optimization with logistic loss, gradient descent, both layers, same, same learning rate on both layers. So just to emphasize, same learning rate, gradient descent, not freezing layers, gradient descent, okay. Um, on this 2XOR data, and you can brute force what the Max Warren solution is for this problem, and it's this really beautiful sparse solution with four values. And her proof explicitly tracks the progress of the weights and shows that it collapses on these four directions. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, you didn't look fully satisfied, but um, okay. But the difference is, yeah, this local and, and global. Um, and then all I'll say for the last part of the other stories is there's actually a very clean and easy way to show these max margin results, which is if you look at this logistic or exponential loss, because once you far go follow it for a while, it becomes the exponential loss. The sublevel sets are invariant to taking, you know, applying a monotone function like the, the log. So optimization on the logistic or the exponential is like optimization on log sum exp. So now if you just write the definition of the margin and just approximate it with the log sum exp, and now do fundamental theorem of calculus, and it, you literally just do some brute forcing in the in the linear separable case, you you immediately get this max margin rate. So this is a fairly uh, Proof with all the details is only a few steps longer than uh, the one I showed you before. And um, this quantity, for instance, you can find all throughout uh, Kai, Kai Fung's paper. Okay. That's why I, I referenced him here. Okay, okay. so that's, that's the end. Uh, just to summarize, so I tried to kick off the program with some open problems. Uh, People were not happy with my open problems, so we do have a task of <laughs> identifying what is the threshold of where the literature is. And yeah, I made a mistake there. I was, yeah, I did not uh, do that uh, properly. Um, then I connected to some uh, scientific stuff, and I'll say that uh, Peter mentioned that I missed, missed also some prior work there, <laughs> some prior work by somebody. And um, then we ended up spending a lot of our time here on gradient descent. And what I was trying to highlight in the other stories, this didn't happen on purpose, but as I was preparing the talk, I just realized log sum x showed up everywhere and everything I was saying. So, okay, so I'll stop there. We're basically at time. Maybe take one question, but I don't want to stop there. Do you want to ask a long one? Um, can you explain this statement you made about how meta trains lama three by freezing the validation set? And I don't, I don't understand that. Okay, I'll give a quick answer. Uh, not because I don't like the question, but just uh, just so that we we, we end on time. Um, so yeah, it's it's I do not my okay. So first of all. For Llama 3, you can find the paper online that's been updated for Llama 3.1, which is the 400 billion parameter model. My recollection was it doesn't fully specify what the procedure was. Here's my recollection. They pick a data mixture in a small model. They, um, I can show you the plot in the, the paper. What it shows is they pick a small model and they, they play with the data proportion to get a certain, um, to, to, yeah, they, they, they made it like a two-dimensional plot. Obviously, while you're playing with the data, data proportions, it's a multi-dimensional thing. It's a grid search, right? It's a grid search to search for these different things. So they try a bunch of points, but they drew it in a one dimension. And then they picked the lowest point, froze that, and then used that to train a larger model. And they did this like bootstrapping sampling thing. That's my understanding. And they built larger and larger models. And their goal was on a log-log plot to get a line like that. And that for them was they've done well. And then they finally got some larger data proportion, which they claim was fitting a scaling law. And yeah, did I give you enough information? So it wasn't clear how much grid searching there is and how many data sources. Uh, they are fairly transparent, so perhaps the details are there. I just didn't see them. But yeah, I highly recommend people that are curious about details of LMs to, to check the GitHub repo for, for it and also the, the paper. It's been my personal favorite resource for these things. I guess, I guess we'll stop there so that we, we have enough time for coffee. Thank you.